On Revealed, we've shown you guys a lot of the tools that we're using in the shop, both our large stationary power tools, as well as some of the small hand tools and power, uh, hand power tools that we're using. But we haven't shown you guys what we're using in the field to install our cabinetry. We have a lot of the same tools that we're using, but let's go jump in the install van and chat with James, our lead installer, and get a look at the tools that we are using in the field. So here in the shop, we have two vans. One is what is in front of me here. This is our install van. And the second is a van that we're using for picking up materials, dropping our cabinetry off to the finisher, delivering to site, things of that nature. So it's not built out to fit any tools. It's wide open. It's actually the tall roof van, so we're able to stand up in it and fit a little bit more vertically in that van. But this van here, not only do we have all the tools we need, but we've also left enough space to bring smaller items into the fields. We can kind of use this van as a bit more of a multi-purpose. Let's jump inside. I think James is taking a nap. Let's go wake him up and uh, run through some of the tools. <laughs> James! <laughs> How you doing, bud? Oh, I'm doing good. You know, I gotta say, I really do miss the full height van in here. Yeah, I, I see like, you're standing in the little hole there. I, I am standing here on the step. It helps, you know, in between the, the joists here, if you will. I like to get my center of gravity a little lower. Just mm, stand like mm. this. That way my head's clear. Strong legs, strong legs. Yeah, good, good for job. the thighs, good for the thighs. <laughs> At first glance, looking in here, it looks like we're running a bit lean with tools. Mm -hmm. I know we do like to keep this van fairly open so that we can bring materials to site, um, smaller cabinetry, so we're not having to take the two vans. And we only have basically one or two racks here with hand tools in it. We have a few additional items, you know, further down in the tail, but there's a little bit more than meets the eye here. What do, what do we have going on behind some of these sustainers? So because of the contour of the van, you're only able to fit two sustainers deep on the bottom, but not the top as far as like making sure that the actual rack clears the door and everything. Um, it also may, allows us to utilize more space in the van for, like you said, cabinets, bring it on site and whatnot. And so when you say deep, you mean there's actually two sustainers back to back here? There are. So from this double divider down, there's actually two cases. Behind each one is another box. And the bottom one has actually our track saw. Um, so dominoes go with the domino. And I've got some batteries and personal tools, a little bandsaw and just some miscellaneous tools that are necessary on site. Now, what are, what are you doing here? What's, what's that all about, spinning the clip? So we had our friends over at Barney and Carey um, see and see us these shelves. So our T-lock system actually goes up and in. So that way, when you're bouncing down the road, these things have no way of falling out. The contour of the van didn't allow us to get double stacked up top. So what we actually did on the back side of where my chop saw is here, is had a few little cubbies for things like um, what we call the apocalypse box and our hole saw kit. So what do you keep in the apocalypse box? Anything and everything. So a little bit of everything. For us, it's things like extra hinges, um, extra mounting plates, feet, rubber bumpers, anything yeah. that's like a random miscellaneous item that may get damaged or broken in the field. Um, that way we're not short a foot or a hinge as we're installing. We have a replacement here without having to keep a, a large amount of inventory on hand. So kind of looking through here, you have a lot of different tools going on. I can see there's multi-tools, jigsaws, a couple of sanders, dominoes, a few different saws. Yep. Walk me through some of the most used tools for installing some of the cabinetry. Let me ask you this. Yeah. If you were walking up a seven story building, right? Which we recently did, no elevator, or let's say all your cabinetry is up, elevator breaks. Right. Now you're just bringing up tools. Yep. What do you bring? Wow. Need a vacuum. Okay. So the SysVac is the way to go for that. Pop it on your shoulder. You can also probably attach one, maybe two sustainers below it. Um, depending what I was doing, fresh install? Fresh install. Gonna have to put the track saw on a hand. Can't, can't carry that up. Um, but I would need it at some point. Uh, what I'm also gonna bring is the laser. It pops up out of there. Everything I need, a couple lasers, mounting plates. Oh, we forgot about levels. Oh. You gotta throw a level over your shoulder. What are you doing, you know? 
depending on what the job needed at the time. Um, I don't intend to bring everything on site the first day. I try to get, yeah. you know, we're, we're doing minimal things on that first day, especially if it's a delivery day. Uh, so we're setting ledgers, we're screwing feet on, I have my backpack usually on with my drills and screw tote. And, a lot of your hand tools. Right, and then yeah. eventually, probably, it would probably be a two tripper at least. So I was thinking more so if I were going up, definitely the vacuum, probably wouldn't bring a track saw. I'd opt for jigsaw, power planer. And I know you like to use the Raz a lot of the I time. Do. It's lieu of the power planer, which is really just a Rotex sander, a high powered sander meets a grinder. Yeah, um, I would say. Great for scribing. I would leave table saw, miter saw. Don't need them right great now. Great to have when you need them, but yep. not something that you necessarily need on every job, especially if you're having to lug everything up uh, a lot of stairs. And then the multi-tool, definitely gonna need that. Just about every kitchen has several outlets or something that you need to pull through those walls. And it's like one of those things, right? You, you make multiple trips on your way. You don't never leave empty handed, never come up empty handed. It's one of those things. Of course. So. so one of the questions that we get asked a lot is about our scribing process. Yeah. Describe that for me. You're, you're on site, you know, different job. We're not, tools aren't an issue here. We got whatever you need. How are you going about your scribing process? What tools are you using and in what order? Depends on how big the piece is, okay. right? If we're doing panels, I'm gonna lay the panel out on the table or sawhorses. Uh, I'll probably back cut a 15 to 20 degree angle, finish it up with the with the RAS, bring it tight to my line that I've made after plumbing and level in the How panel. are you making that line? What are you doing? You're scribing it. But right. Any particular scribe that you like? Or are you just using a block and a pencil? When do I have the AccuScribe? And I also have um, scribe. Compass Scribe, right? Yep. The general. Each one has its own use, right? The general one is good for anything that's textured especially brick or stone. The AccuScribe has got a little bit wider base, so it's gonna take those smooth, um, like gradual changes in the wall a little bit nicer. Um, each one has their purpose, but I'm keeping nice. both on me. All right, so you got your line. Are you you adding tape to the to the panel to get your line, or are you just drawing your line right onto yeah, you the always wanna, panel? You always wanna tape on the piece, because it, it helps with A, like you're not leaving pencil lines on there in case your scribe is not exactly on that line. Sometimes things change or you want to leave a little bit of room so you can bring it down later, but um, it also helps with tear out and, and chipping. So you're able to put the panel up multiple times. If you got, like if it's a big panel and you didn't, weren't so confident on your first scribe, you can always um, test fit it, take a look at it, rescribe on that tape line. You're not trying to, you know, you would never peel that tape line and then try to rescribe on that because you're gonna to have to add another piece of tape and cut exactly on your previous scribe, which just doesn't work out. So when we get started, when we first get in the job, yeah. one of the first things that we do is set a ledger on the wall. Right. So we're using a combination of levels, the laser, we're setting those two by four ledgers mm -hmm. right to the wall. That gives us a good starting platform, a level platform for our cabinet bases to go on, right. our base cabinets. On the front, you mentioned that we're using these adjustable levelers. We've done a video on that before, so we can go ahead and tag that so you guys can take a look at how we're doing that but a lot of the times the walls aren't exactly level. So as we're going through this project, we're getting our cabinets nice and level, but what happens when the cabinet is tilting off the wall, either if it's on, either on the top or on the bottom? What are we using uh, for that? I notice you have a whole bunch of extra stuff. We have a few screw totes here that, uh, looks like there's quite a variety of screws in here. I, I'm assuming we got mounting screws in here for both mounting into the walls, right. mounting cases together but I led you into this question looking at this bucket. Right. This is the trusty shim bucket. Shim bucket. Okay. When you're having that problem where your cabinets are gonna be tilted out off the wall, but they are level and plumb, um, you never wanna screw it to the wall without something behind it, whether that be a flat piece because it's a consistent yep, I thing you have over some, the top. I do have some well. eighth inch stock up top there for anything like that. Uh, but generally speaking, the wall's gonna move around a lot, especially on your long runs of cabinets. So mm -hmm. we'll either cut these or break them off in pieces. That didn't work out. <laughs> oh, I gotta hold that one, huh? Um, yeah, we'll either cut these or break them off in pieces and make sure that they're tight behind the case as we screw them in. Um, when you do screw them in, sometimes it does suck a little tighter than you thought it was going to. So you back the screw back out, give it a little more and then plan for um, plan for being plumb once you're your shim is in and your screw is tight. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And then you have the adjustability from the feet in the front to really raise it up to make sure you're level uh, going across the top, let's say front to back or even side to side. You have that adjustment there. 
So as we're kind of going through a little bit more, you have a lot of stuff here, a couple different hoses. You have a large square, you have a couple different hoses. I'm assuming the hoses are because every tool has a different port. You're always gonna need a different size depending on which tool you're going with. We're also able to set up one vacuum with two hoses. Um, gives us the ability to set up like a workstation, you know, where we'd have a chop saw and the table saw set up or um, the chop saw and maybe a track saw or jigsaws or um, So you're not playing razz. that game of, of unplugging one tool to use another. Right, right. Gotcha. You've got dust collection no matter what. That's a big thing on our job sites especially. Yeah. Um, especially the multi-unit jobs where you got units to your left and right or people are walking in and out. You want to keep the dust uh, on right. the low. Yeah, and I know we have two vacuums in here that we use for ours, our tools. I know our field crews, they also have a couple vacuums too. So there's plenty of vacuums on site to kind of plug into and we're not fighting over tools. I think that's an even bigger issue is who has what tools, right? I mean, for instance here, you have a Domino and a Lamello that live in this van. These are tools that we're using in the shop every day. So it's nice that we have our set and you have your set. There's no, oh, I gave that to James, it's in the install van for this job, you know, really wish I had that. It it's comes a with lot, a large cost, right? but I think, you know, in the long run, especially with the volume that we're doing, definitely worth having the, the doubled up sets of tools. And it saves us, well, it saves us time too, in the case that like, I need to do something on site or a lamello wasn't lined up or a domino needs to be added or something like that. I can go ahead and do that in the field. It doesn't need to be brought back to the shop or I don't need to go grab a a tool from somebody I can just do it right then and there and that's I mean to me that's worth its time yeah yeah for sure and it's going to pay for itself eventually right so as we're kind of continuing through here I see you got some third hands I know those come in handy all the time especially most of the time you're doing a lot of these installs yourself so those third hands are probably worth their weight in gold oh they're excellent but what's this this is a it looks like a mess what do you got going on in here <laughs> oh let's pull it down and I'll show you because it is a little bit of a mess, but it does have a little bit of everything. It's kind of similar to the apocalypse box um, where it's got just kind of things that will end up saving me time and saving. So right off the bat, this is huge, right? This is you guys have seen before. We have the bloom mini press in our shop to bore hinges. This is their eco drill. This helps you or this is just a jig to bore hinges. In the doors, we used to use this in the shop before we had the mini press. Now this just lives in the van where he's able to add hinges wherever he needs to with ease. You know, there are situations where we don't bore the doors here in the shop because we're not sure where it's exactly going to land. So it is super helpful to have here uh, in the van for you all the time. Additional edge banding, trash bags. All sorts of edge banding. Yeah, it's like stuff that we'll I'll use, but not all the time. You know, I got putty knives for little plaster touch-ups here and there. I got um, wipe on poly for- Scribes, every time we do a scribe, whether it's on the- Especially on the floor, um, especially in bathrooms, anything like MDF, um, MDF solid, doesn't matter really what it is. Every scribe will get uh, polyurethane on it just yeah. to seal it up, make sure no moisture can ever get in it down the road. Exactly. Um, I I've got rags, irons, an anchors. Iron for the edge band. I've got anchors. We don't usually use the anchors, but I do keep some with us. Every once in um, a while, you run into that situation. Right. And we're, we have the ability to block most of the stuff that we have off. Um, generally speaking, every when we go into a project, every wall is opened up and we're able to put blocking in for our cases so that we have one high right, one high left, one high, I mean, one low right, one low left. Yep. Um, for everything and and that's the way it works out but sometimes you end up being in a gap between studs and you need to anchor your case to the wall so i keep those in there just in case blocking is key i know you've recently started taking care of the blocking for us we we used to have the framing team do it and now we've kind of transitioned into us taking care of it so it is always in the right locations and it's not taking any of their time to do stuff for us uh what is this pump that you have here what are you using that for take my uh, blood pressure for when I get a little stressed on site. Mm, happen often? <laughs> no, it's a wind bag. Um, it's a leveling bag, so you're able to basically shim things up with this temporarily and slide stuff out of the way. It really helped us with that project over in Weston with the big heavy glass doors with the mirrors on them. Yep. Just not being able to, you know, you want to protect the floor and, it's, and you also want to protect that glass. So we used these anytime we took those in and out 
and it just made sure we didn't break the glass and we didn't dent the floor. All right, and then over here, I see we just got a couple of extra cords, caulking guns, and a few ladders. Um, and some of the other things that I see, but I don't see are booties, floor protection. I know those are things that are in the cab. We keep yeah. a lot of that stuff on site. Uh, floor protection is generally done for us, um, but in the case that we do have to do it, we have some here, we'll grab it on the way out. Um, we have the ability to you know, pretty much just get whatever we need for whenever we need it. Yeah. All right, so I guess the last question would be, you have tons of tools in here. It looks like you're pretty well set up for everything that you need. What happens when there's that like random specialty thing that you do need that isn't in your van? How are you handling those situations? Yeah, like you see, we got, I have a hose here right now, but I don't have my compressor in here because I don't really need it, but the hose lives in there. It's out of the way, no need to keep it. Um, in, very infrequently do we actually have to nail anything off as far as cabinetry goes. Um, there will be just some jobs that we have to do um, different moldings and whatnot, but generally speaking, the field crews take care of that stuff. You got plenty of room here to grab something out of the shop, kind of throw it in here, leaving plenty of space for cabinetry parts, miscellaneous stuff. I know we're storing a lot of things in our storage units, so like plumbing supplies or drawers, fixtures, what have you. Plenty of room to throw that stuff in here. You have your personal hand tools in another bag or pack out system. Plenty of room to throw that stuff in before you go. So you can keep a few things here in the van, a few things in the shop, but primarily we have everything we need in here. If you Just got a call and needed to go, you yeah. could grab your backpack and head out. Yep. All right, guys, so that's gonna do it for this week's episode by James. Please, if you guys have any questions, drop them in the comments below. Shoot me a message on Instagram. Let us know. We do go live every Friday or Monday to answer your questions from the comments below. Subscribe, like this video, leave us some comments, and let your friends know as well. Thanks for watching. Now here's the Q&A. Welcome to the Q&A section of Revealed. Ken and I are sitting on the lovely patio, also known as the loading dock, at the NS Builders Warehouse. Shop. Warehouse? Oh, warehouse. Shop. I mean, it's looking like a warehouse, all the storage we got here right now. Let's jump right into the YouTube questions. Let's do it. Tool you wish existed. Oof. Didn't we cover this last week? No. No? I'm just having like I PTSD you, from you it. You answered it in text, but I thought it would oh, be a fun Oh, that's right. Yeah. I thought it would be a fun one to look at the stuff. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> You know, nothing nothing comes to mind right off the bat. There's, and I think this is what I wrote out too, is there's been so many times where you're working on something, you're like, oh, I wish this existed. I wish there was a modification for this. Yep. Um, you know, for instance, we put a domino, a three tenon, through all of our door joinery. And at first, the distance that we're using for that domino, it's not centered on the actual, it is centered on the styles and rail, but it's, it's not, within Festool's um, positive stops. They have one that's built into the machine and then they have an attachment and it doesn't fit on either of them. Uh, so that was one of those things where it's like, somebody should invent this product that kind of bridges that gap. And um, who did it? Senko maybe? No, that's a nail gun company. Totally lying. Uh, I forget the brand. Um, that the guy that has. But they they made it yeah. and it's been nice to have. You know, we, we picked one up and it, it didn't take off like you would wish. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm probably like the odd case with stuff like that. Mm. Um, hence probably why it's not made. It's probably difficult to market something like that. Right. And you know, the need isn't there. Yeah. You know, I'm one of how many people that want this tool. So it's a really one off kind of thing. So there's a lot of stuff like that, that I think pops up from time to time. But I mean, uh, I guess I'm not missing them. So I don't know that it doesn't exist, you know, okay. until it does exist, like with the Domino, where it, it bridged a lot of gaps. Nobody knew that it, they needed it because they didn't know that it existed or didn't have it previously. What's, <laughs> uh, what's Ken's favorite hair product? <laughs> TJ Chippendale. We're gonna, we're gonna that. have to do a whole, a whole series on my hair apparently, right? It gets, think, there's a lot of questions about my hair. I think we should do an episode that has nothing to do with cabinetry. Do you want to like, you want to go through my morning routine? You can wake no, me up one morning and no. just, you know, follow through everything. <laughs> Not today. Uh, uh, same it's past morning. Huh? It's past morning. What, uh, do you have a hair product? You must. I use a J. <laughs> it's actually just type on two. <laughs> uh, pomade. 
trash pullout brand. Uh, we did last week's episode. There's a trash pullout. Yeah, Halo. Halo. Halo's the name of the brand. A little bit of. Um, are they owned by Hefala? Are they their own brand? There's a lot of kind of intermingling with brands when it comes to things like the the trash units, the magic corners that we showed. Kesson Bomber makes the Le Mans. They used to make the magic corner, but then I heard somebody else bought them, and that's why the price went up. I don't know who owns. What but anymore? It's hard to keep track. It's probably just licensing. Right, but the Halo logo is on the actual trash units that we use. Um, so those have been great. They, they come in a couple different sizes, a couple different colors, um, with soft clothes, without soft clothes. So it's our go-to. We've had a lot of good luck with those units, so we'll continue to use them. The Halo, is yeah. that something you have to a special order, or can you get that? Yeah, we, we get it right off the shelf. Home Depot um, or Lowe's. It's not a Home Depot. We're getting them through Richelieu, who we get most of our hardware from. There's a bunch of other online sources that have a lot of the same hardware. I'm sure they're available on those websites as well. I mean, there's a ton of them. I can't rattle them all off. Right. Um, but yeah, if you just like search, it's H-A-I-L-O. Halo? I think that's how. Yeah. Um, their cargo, Halo Cargo is what the name of that particular trash is. And usually they're in stock. We don't have any delays with getting those. They come here in a few days. What is your favorite part of the cabinet building process? Where do you get the most enjoyment? I like it, uh, the front end and the back end. So I like really like the design side of it mm -hmm. and seeing like the, what the space, imagining what the space could be. Conception. Right, yep. So you kind of get that through conception and then yeah I do enjoy fabricating it don't get me wrong but standing back at the end of the project and you're like okay that's it that's done it's built like I made this or you know now the team made it I was part of it um, that the end product is really fulfilling and I think that's that's where a lot of guys probably um, might not get to see you know I know in shops that I've been in before and from other people they're strictly in the shop so they're fabricating it but once it goes to finish or once it leaves the shop, they no longer get to see it. They don't install it. They don't get back to site for finals. A shop I was at previously, we, we would do everything. We finished it, installed it, but we were never there for, you know, final paints, final stones, you know, um, plumbing, because we were just strictly millwork. Yeah. So we didn't always get to see all that. Um, and then especially being in the shop back then, I wasn't going back on site as often to Kind of see the final final thing so it was yes you still get that fulfillment of seeing the the millwork side of it installed but you don't really see the big picture of it come together until you see like photos of it afterwards but it's not the same it's not the same yeah, it's not as fulfilling to see the photo of the finished product rather than actually like stand there in front of it everything's installed everything's in place and uh ready for use so just seeing your design kind of come to life yeah that is something that you don't really think about that someone who solely works in the shop right won't necessarily get that end satisfaction. Right, and you know, even with James, our installer, right, there's probably times where he's been on site, he installs everything, but then doesn't get the opportunity to go back once stone is in, once, you know, all the plumbing's done. Because for us, it's what, about a two to three week lead time for stone. Mm. So we try to offset it so that our base cabinets go in, then we get stone templated, mm. and then we start to, well, it's all in one process, right? We're not stopping to let stone come and get templated. We're templating during the process once all the base cabinets are in. So we can continue on while stone's being fabricated. It's not like we get the entire kitchen in, then get it templated, wait another two to three weeks. So there's this longer gap there. Mm. We're getting it all done. We're trying to stagger it a little bit. Schedule it so that once stone is in, plumbing goes in right away. So there are times where we're there and often being the builder, we're on site for a lot of other things as well. So we do get to go back and see everything completed, but strictly mill workshops may not get that opportunity all the time. So it is definitely really interesting and, and fulfilling to see it all come together. With the popularity of water-based 2K, what are your thoughts on site finish? See, that's tricky. I think there's a lot of pros to having a site finish, but I think there's also a lot of cons. I don't think you're going to get as nice of a finish on site as you will in a controlled spray booth. And I've had people argue this to me before, um, that they can control the environment that they're spraying in on yeah. site. And then they've gone and done it and executed it. And it hasn't been good. It hasn't been nearly as good as 
a shop sprayed finish. Just because of the control or? Right, there's there's dust in, and maybe this is user error, but I haven't come into, um, I haven't had the experience of working with somebody who is capable of producing a shop-like finish on site. It's, it's always, yes, they're good, but they're not as good as a shop finish. The flip side to this though, is now you're getting all your fillers, your scribes, everything is done cut so you're not you're not scratching anything or um, you know if you do dent something or damage a piece in some way or somehow you can repair it on site mm. have it finished then right. um, but I so that's really the benefit to finishing on site in in my opinion from where I see it yeah I mean other people who do the shop finish uh, sorry the site finishes they might have a different point of view mm. um, and I'm interested in hearing that because it is something that we've talked a lot about doing but you know I, I can't can't give up the the shop finish it's just too good from what I've experienced versus a field finish it brings up another question that made me think of something I've heard there are people that build their cabinets mm -hmm. on site mm -hmm. or in the shop what kind of somebody walking up here not here but uh, I'm still <laughs> yeah. obviously we build ours in a shop yeah do you see any sort of benefit or reason why you'd want to build cabinets on site? I mean, I'm sure like once you're in that space, you now have finished sizes that you're dealing with, which everything that we're doing, we are measuring typically a rough framing stage, right. accounting for board, plaster, things of that nature. Oftentimes we, we have enough wiggle room in fillers and what have you that, you know, we're on point all the time. We, we've done it enough times now where we shouldn't be running into any issues that's not to say issues don't happen i mean right. we've we've certainly run into our fair share of needing to remake stuff due to a mismeasurement obviously the goal here is to um lessen the amount of time that that happens and so when you're on site yeah you you can you have the measurements right there in front of you i would say it probably delays the project a little bit because now you, you can't start your fabrication until you're a little bit further along on the field side of things okay um but also working on site is m difficult enough that you're not having the same tooling. So maybe you're not getting as accurate of cuts or not using the best tool for that job. If you're a, a field guy, maybe that's all you know and you are perfectly capable with those tools. But coming into the shop and being able to use something like a slider is amazing. How else are you processing full sheet goods in the mm. field? Like that's, that's difficult. And it's not to say people aren't doing it, mm. but it's a totally different set of tools and um, different skill sets. And you know, ultimately I think we're much more versatile here in the shop than you can be in the field. Okay. Uh, I think the guy who asked the poly question said something. No lines between trim on the site finish. Another perk, I suppose. What part of the cabinet process do you see changing? Or have you changed, you know, with experience? You've kind of modified to fit. You know, adding the domino into the doors, and this is something that we've talked about soon too, is really kind of showcasing that test. Does the domino actually help out? Right. That was something that I wasn't doing previously. Didn't, didn't think it needed to be done. But now it's a standard here in our shop. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other little things that we've implemented as standards. Simple things like the distance for where we start our hinges. You know, we're going with a particular distance down from the door, up from the door on the bottom. And it's just kind of an arbitrary number, but it's a standard that we have kind of made. Is that kind of along the lines of what you're thinking? I was just thinking, thinking? something, uh, I guess, along the lines of, uh, you know, people say, oh, we've always done it this way. Right. And you were probably taught a certain way and then now that you're kind of calling the shots in the shop, maybe you're like, well, why have we always done it this way? Maybe there's something. Yeah. I guess the domino kind of answered that. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm sure there are things that it's like, oh, I've always done it this way. But, you know, working with Nick and the rest of the team, it's always like, well, why? Everything's questioned. Well, why are we doing it that way? How can we make it better? You know, it's not, let's not pigeonhole ourselves to one process or one particular way of doing things. If that's the best way to do it, and everybody can agree on that, then great. Let's let's not reinvent the wheel here. Mm. But can it be better? Can it be faster? Can we get a, a stronger product out of it? Um, 
you know, just kind of asking those questions and always just being aware of, of if there is a better or different way to do things is key. All right. Uh, someone chimed in here saying we have we were field building 15 years ago and shop build is higher quality and faster. Oh, I have a question here. How do you guys deal with pre-finished painted crown in terms of touching up? So we actually, we covered this in a whole episode, okay. right? Um, we are making all of our crown pieces and our toe kicks, baseboards, things like that, especially like furniture base. We're making them all in one piece. So we're shop fabricating all of our miters. Oftentimes we'll run everything long. And for our inside miters, we usually run them long and cope in the field. We have coped in the shop a few times. That's where it gets difficult, where if something's damaged along the way, it makes it really difficult to repair that piece. Most often it needs to be replaced. So we'll save our inside miters, our copes, for the field. Um, I guess, knock on wood, we haven't had too many issues with them being damaged. Anything like if we're tacking a nail hole, it's usually like a wax filler and um, some touch-up paint, but it's tiny pinpoints, right? We're not, you know, putting like screw heads into anything that has to get repaired. So it's just kind of standard repairs. If we are damaging something, like it, we've we've cut returns too short or pieces too short, and we've had to make new returns. We're not going to try to field touch that up or clean it up. It's just you're never going to get the right finish, right um, look. So we'll have to just eat it, remake it, send it back out to finish, and reinstall the new piece and hopefully learn from that mistake if you weren't working in the cabinet shop what would you be doing if you still were in construction like what would you what would you be your next choice outside of working in cabinetry probably kind of where my role is heading now i, I feel like that's a cop-out answer though right because <laughs> like the design no. side of it kind of well like we just <laughs> talked about right oh, okay fine Let, let's just go with design. design i do i do enjoy that side of it mm -hmm. um it, you know, Low I am, overhead. Well, I mean, some of those programs get expensive. <laughs> Don't um, tell me about expensive programs. Uh, yeah, right. Um, but I do. I, I really enjoy that side of it. Yeah. I don't have enough knowledge to be a designer, you know. Um, but hey, I can learn, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I would say I'd go with the design side of it. All right. Hey guys, thanks for joining. But. I think that's it for today. Uh, if you do have more questions, um, drop them on the comments in the YouTube video, and uh, we'll get them next week. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya.